Human culture thrives when discussions about what is true, what is just, and what is beautiful is remembered as an ongoing, never-ending, never-complete conversation. To quote Milton, by the known rules of ancient liberty, welcome to Risky Conversations. I am your co-host, Ember Sadat. Join me and my co-host, Ace Deliri, as we engage in this ancient tradition of discussions around interesting topics with utterly fascinating people. Welcome to Risky Conversations, Dr. McGilchrist. Please introduce yourself to our listeners. Oh, thanks, Jose. I'm Ian McGilchrist. I'm a writer and a, a, a psychiatrist. Um, I'm best known for my book, The Master and His Emissary. Perfect. We are big fans. <clears throat> I tried to read your... You know what? Uh, sometimes there are books you read, and then there are books that you try to read, uh, and it becomes a bit of a, a struggle. Your book is one of those ones where, like, every sentence I have to stop and go, wait a minute, he just referenced something that is so heavily <laughs> densely packed that I have to stop and digest that and have to go and look up the reference you're making. So it took me months <laughs> to read your book, and I love when I come across <laughs> works like that. I absolutely love it. Your your oh, breadth oh, and depth well, of knowledge is absolutely astonishing. Well, thank you. I mean, I I always say that if I hadn't actually written it, I wouldn't have had time to read it, but I'm... Constantly <laughs> astonished that um, people tell me uh, they're reading it for the third time and, and getting new stuff out of it. So, yeah, there we are. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, this book is going to be mined for treasures for a lifetime because, like I said, your your ability to weave a story and to help people understand what's going on around them is so intricately well-informed in terms of your references and your literature uh uh, composition with regards to, you know, history and the Greeks and, and, you know, various tribes. And then you bring in your scientific point of view into it. And in your addition to music, um, every time, like, uh, I was driving and I was listening to it in the audiobook form and I, I have to stop sometimes. Right. I, look, I look like a crazy man uh, on the road. I'm like, oh my God, my mind just got completely rewired. What did he just say? Rewind that, rewind that. And I, I look, like, I look like an absolute madman on the road trying to process and parcel what you did but um i've, I've absolutely <laughs> loved it and um oh, it, actually, it actually brings us perfectly in line with what we're looking at in the, in the state of the world today because as you could see it seems like the a world that's been heavily constructed by the by the left hemisphere uh is now mm-hmm. showing us it's uh the, the the feedback loop of nature saying uh you've gone too far in that direction what are your thoughts on that yeah well gosh I do think in lots of ways there are resonances. I mean, one is that, of course, the theme of my book is that we have been thinking much too narrowly and in much too reductionist a way about what it means to be alive, um, what the natural world is and our relationship with it. Um, So something like this, something that is um, immediately recontextualizes your life, is I think kind of helpful. Uh, I mean, I'm not underestimating, obviously, the suffering that it can cause um, and will cause. Uh, but on the other hand, my feeling is that we needed something to sort of bring us up short and get us back in touch with things. It's very easy to tune out when everything seems superficially fine because the machine is churning on and you're doing all the things you're supposed to do. And it's a moment like this that really stops you in your tracks, helps you to to remember that you're mortal actually, which is a no small thing uh, in the Renaissance, which was the period of um, European history that I suppose most of us would think of as one of the great periods for humanity. Um, People used to have a skull on their desk, not out of some macabre (laughs) uh, shock value interest that people might do now, but in fact, just to keep before your eyes that life is precarious, that we don't control it, it isn't forever, and we really got to make the best of what we've got, um, which means treating it as valuable. Treating it as something, you know, special. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. Uh, I, I mean, uh, you look at the world, the way it's been functionally reorganized so that people are a means, not an ends. And they're like, find the yeah. cheapest means we can get, outsource everything to the, to the country where they'll just replace one guy with another and the devalued 
uh, the actual process of you know uh, la- love and labor, all of that's been separated. Everything has just become, as you've said, yeah. it's become a mechanical number. Yeah. And so that, yeah. it's it's utterly fascinating to watch this process unfold, having your point of view as a reference from which to to, to sort of relate to what's going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think some good things may may yet come of it. I, one of the themes of my book is that. Um, it's not good when people behave atomistically um, striving to maximize for themselves whatever it is they think is going to make them happy, which, by the way, in the end, in that spirit, never will make you happy. Um, nor is it good for people to be swallowed up, their identity swallowed up in categories and so on. And what may come out of this is that we start living as individuals, but in a community, we think more about Already I can see it happening with people I know that they're thinking more about their neighbors, being more close to and listening to their families. So the sort of things that really help to root our lives in what gives them meaning, I think these will be accentuated um, rather than anything else by, by this development. Whether we can hang on to the very good things that are coming out of it um, when it's over, I don't know. I'm, I'm somewhat doubtful because it's like being in pain. When you're in pain, you, you, you think, I never want to endure this again. And when you're no longer in pain, you just think, ah, oh, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, the environment, uh, as people call it, but I call it nature, uh, to which we belong, from which we emerge and to which we return, is is bouncing back from the kind of beating that we've been giving it. We've been living in the most extraordinary way, um, as it were, opposed to nature in a way that, you know, is almost unprecedented. And with the power and the ability to attack the very roots of life. And in, in, in this sort of closing down of all that is unnecessary, and um, people, people tell me that, you know, live in cities that for once they can hear the birds sing. They can actually, uh, the, the, the air is clear. There's no planes flying overhead. Just these little things bring home to you the huge impact that is being had on the world at large. I, I agree with you 100 percent on that front, because one of the things I've noticed is that we've sort of had to step back and just say, look, I know you could sit at home, pull out your iPhone, order Uber Eats, and have food delivered to your house that you don't even know who prepared it, where the ingredients came from, and you could binge watch a show that costs $300 million to make or a movie, and you think you're in control. But very quickly, you realize that a little germ uh, can bypass all the defense mechanisms that have been set up. It can bypass all the sophisticated technology and security, and your, your technology may have brought you to a point of view where you think you're 10,000 years ahead, but our biology is still 10,000 years back, and the man, the hunter, who's created a comfortable little cave for himself, is still susceptible to nature when she wants to rule the, the operation. And, and it's, uh, I hope um, nobody thinks that being in touch with what it actually means, um, as you were saying, to be uh, a living natural being, an animal, a very special animal, but nonetheless an animal. I, that, that's not a backward step. That is, <laughs> that's the foundation of everything. And it's the loss of that sense which seems to me to have got us into trouble, as well as the entirely false belief that we can control things. Fortunately, we can't control very much because if we did, we'd, we wouldn't know what ends to be pursuing and we would be destroying ourselves, perhaps to an extent we're already starting to do that. But, you know, we can't really control much in this world. And as a psychiatrist, a lot of my patients, uh, especially the anxious ones, used to express their anxiety in terms of the lack, the sense of control, that their life is out of control. And... I used to sort of try to get people to see that actually everything is out of your control, but that's absolutely fine. <laughs> um, uh, it starts from the moment you're born. You can't choose when you're born or where you're born or to which parents or 
any of the features like your height or your color or anything else. So you just are born and then the circumstances come to you over which you have very little control. And the secret of life is not to force it to go to a scheme you've got of how it should be, but to ride the waves as they come, not to get hit down by them by trying to resist them. It's a very obvious and perhaps rather banal point, but it's something we've also lost the sense of, that actually we need to use what comes to us as a gift, not as something to be resisted or rejected because it isn't exactly what we wanted. So uh, how much of this world has been created by lying to ourselves? Lying to ourselves. Um, I think that's a very good way of putting it. We deceive ourselves. We're probably not aware of the extent to which we do deceive ourselves. And you could look at this uh, epidemic or pandemic as a kind of reality check of a kind. Uh, in exploring what it means to be viewing the world through the model of it, which we get from the left hemisphere of the brain. One of the things I draw attention to is its ability to make stuff up, not not sort of willfully, but just to not even aware it's doing it, make it up so that it seems all right what we're doing. Uh, it's a kind of denial, basically, and it's extreme. And this is not a, just a figure of speech. People who have right hemisphere deficits, uh, for example, have a right hemisphere stroke, may be paralyzed down one whole half of their body, but they actually deny that there's anything wrong with them. Not, not because they're sort of, you know, willfully kidding themselves. They just, they, they don't get it. And when I hear some of the pronouncements um, that are made by <laughs> well, one particular politician who I won't even need to make, name, but you know who I mean by this, uh, that it's all fine and there's no problem and we don't need tests and we don't need, uh, uh, you know, masks and um, uh, safety kits for, for doctors and nurses because, of course, there isn't really a problem here. I mean, that's, that is denial. And we've all been doing it in one way or another, yes. We, we believe that we can go on living the way that we've been living and nothing bad will happen. And that's, of course, because we don't understand exponential change. Um, I, 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 the, the, the image of this that I always like is a col colony of bacteria. You know, if a colony of bacteria um, doubles every minute and at 12 noon the jar is full, when was it only half full? 11.59. When was it only a quarter full? 11.58. So at 11.57, it was only an eighth full. And people would have said, well, what's the problem? We've got lots and lots of room. Well, we're in that situation. We're approaching a crisis very rapidly. And we just think, well, it's fine, because right now it is somehow. We can always find a little bit more wind room. But we're not really taking in the, the impact of what it is we're doing. So a quick question on that front. Why, why do you think our brains, like some people intuitively understand compounding power laws. Like um, I, I, I would say I'm sort of lucky in that regard because I kind of get it and that's because I write code. So I kind of see cascading effects within systems and how they interact and when, you know, multiple requests come in at different times and all at once. The system, I've seen it in front of my eyes and as I'm watching it, I know what's going on. Similarly, when this... Um, uh, pandemic went from an epidemic to a pandemic back in you know early January we were kind of like waving the flag saying there's something going on here but why do you think it is that the vast majority of people are just not able to see this is there no evolutionary benefit in seeing this because I'm sure when you know in travel times you would see a disease that crops up you know one person gets sick two two to four eventually third third day the whole crew is down right so why do you think it is that we are intuitively unaware or is it just that we're we're denying it, just like that's that that stroke patient? Yeah, it's a very good question. I don't think we really have the answer to it. It's a fairly well recognised phenomenon that most people don't appreciate exponential growth. Um, but probably, you know, on the savanna, so to speak, there weren't that many instances in which you would have needed to see things in that way. It's really only when you survey a very large bunch of data which on the whole, one doesn't get, you know, just through sense perception, um, that you can see these patterns, which is why they're so striking to us, I think. But I, I really don't know the answer to that. 
all I can say is that we just really don't get it until it's too late. And, you know, there are a couple of important studies um, of the fates of civilizations. The one I think is best is uh, called Immoderate Greatness by William Offuls, O-P-H-U-L-S. It's only a short read. It's 80 pages without the notes. But, you know, I defy anybody to begin that book and put it down. Um, He's a very remarkable writer and he's looked at the demise of past civilizations. The book called Immoderate Greatness takes its title from Gibbon writing about the fall of the Roman Empire, that it was through its immoderate greatness that it fell. And he shows three reasons um, that are to do with, uh, as it were, the objective facts of the growth of of an empire, and three reasons that are to do more with the way we start to think. that mean that in the end, this situation will always inevitably collapse. So the the, the slightly grim news <laughs> is that, you know, whether we like it or not, this way we're living simply can't go on. Yeah, you know, I, w- I wanted to ask you about that because um, there's an interesting layer to all this, which is that, you know, you see dynasties grow out of nothing. And then, as they say, they get old and fat and then they, they burn from within. It seems like this is a repeating theme. Like, uh, I, I'm not sure if you see it this way, but maybe this is Rome's second burning. Uh, we got so happy to externalize all costs to the, the lowest uh, manufacturing base on the planet where people are treated inhumanely. And we're like, yeah, we're good. You know, I have my iPhone. I have my big flat screen TV that costs $200. There's nothing, you know, all my costs have been externalized. Is this yet again uh, another example of, a, of Rome burning? Do you see it that way or am I just way off base? You could point to you know, a score of of facets in which the way we're heading look exactly like um, an accident waiting to happen. Um, When Rome fell in 410 AD, or whenever you like to to put it, it took, roughly speaking, nearly a thousand years for civilization to recoup. Um, Well, you know, we haven't got a thousand years uh, if we <laughs> uh, the, the only thing that will stop uh, the destruction and leave a planet that we can inhabit is if we are reduced to a way of life which is far more realistic I say reduced but it might actually be a wonderful hair raising experience but a wonderful rebirth a kind of renaissance of its own it would mean as having many fewer demands, relying very much less on expensive, um, complicated um, things, and living closer to nature with more modest demands in communities that are small enough, up to about 200 people, that you can actually know one another and trust. I think outside of that, it's not going to be possible to build something. And I don't like to think what will happen on the way to it. But I think, yes, your image of Rome burning again is is, is about right. And we're fiddling while Rome burns. So in this regard, like you were saying, yeah, like you're saying how it'll take time for us to rebuild. And we're seeing right now an accelerated process of how time has basically been compressed. You know what I mean? So in this regard, the two hemispheres, given your point of view, how do they how do they distinguish time and what is it what what does time look like on the left side versus on the right side versus when the whole wow. has been synchronized? Well, that's a, an absolutely fascinating question and I'm I'm not sure it it, it relates immediately to uh, the sort of process of acceleration I'm talking about, but in fact I have been spending a lot of time thinking about time <laughs> and how the two hemispheres do conceive it differently. And effectively, what you find is, and the easiest way to see what happens is when people have some sort of deficit in their right hemisphere, is that what happens is they actually describe time being broken down into a series of stills, so that actually motion and flow, which are at the root of life and indeed at the root of existence, get transformed into a sort of digitized condition whereby one 
absolutely static snapshot is replaced with another absolutely static snapshot. It's rather like an old cine film that's got stuck and is juddering very slowly. So what, what you see is that they've lost the capacity to see the depth of time. By depth, I mean the extent of it, the stretch of it, the flow of it, the duration of it, what the French philosopher Bersant called durée, as opposed to what he called temps, which was punctate, time, an instant, an instant, an instant, like that. Hmm. And we, we've lost that sense. As we, when you have uh, right hemisphere damage, a similar phenomenon happens in space as happens in time. It becomes flattened. So it becomes two-dimensional. So people sometimes describe this rather unpleasant experience that it's like they're confronted by a flat screen. Um, they, they want to read up to the corner of reality as they see it and tear it down to find the sheet that's behind it. So in other words, what happens when the right hemisphere is not properly in charge, not properly working, is that the depth of time and the depth of space are replaced by a flattening of space into two dimensions and a loss of the flow dimension of time, just to one dimension of a point. Hmm. And curiously, there's a parallel to this in depth and emotion. So people um, in, in right hemisphere failure um, have a very narrow range of emotion. They're not unemotional. It used to be said that the left hemisphere is, you know, calm and reasonable, a little bit boring, but at least it's, you know, reliable and not too emotional. Uh, all of that is complete gibberish. The left hemisphere is not reliable. It's quick and dirty. It makes snap judgments and it's highly emotional. One of the most, um, one of the most lateralized, in fact, the most lateralized of all emotions is anger and it lateralizes to the left hemisphere. So they, people who uh, are working on a left hemisphere only are typically irritable um, and shallow, facetious, jokey, but they don't seem to realize there's anything to feel any deep emotion like sorrow or sadness or empathy. So they get cut off emotionally. Now, it may be a bit far-fetched, and it's, you know, there are, there are much more obvious ways in which our civilization looks like one in which the left hemisphere is, is running the show, it's bureaucratic, it's it's only interested in quantity, not quality. It substitutes categories for the unique case. It's black and white in its thinking. It's not good on uncertainty. It ignores implicit meaning. You know, all of those things. But you could also say that in a way we've turned our world into a flat, two-dimensional world. Um, and we only think about the point where we're at in time. We don't see ourselves situated in a long flow. We've lost the sense of history and we've forgotten about our responsibilities to the future. And at the same time, I would say our, you know, emotional repertoire has become um, more shallow, irritable, angry, self-righteous. Just look at, um, you know, social media. Just look at um, little factional groups um, sending hate messages about people who don't have to have the same political views that they have. So, you know, <laughs> you can see it there, if you like. I wouldn't I wouldn't object to that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, as I was listening to you, uh, I thought of three things that popped up to my head to just help crystallize this idea that you had. Uh, so part of the work I do, because I work at a telecom, is that we, we have signal modulators that actually take sound and sample it. So as you're talking... It's sampling it at, let's say, 48 times a second or 192 times a second or whatever the case may be so that you could compact uh, the information using less resources to transmit that to other people because the key is let's get the idea out there and uh, the voice quality. Who cares? And I noticed that's interesting because when you go to listen to a symphony live when the actual instruments are there versus if you listen to a billion bits of recorded uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the, the experience is never the same. And it's sort of like when you look at a painting that took years, uh, which is where the time dimension comes into paint, versus if you took a picture of it and, and, and photocopied it and said, here, this is what the Mona Lisa looks like, you don't get the same visceral feeling. Is that because the right hemisphere knows 
that what you're looking at is a slice and not the whole, and therefore it doesn't allow the 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 full experience to be you know connecting to the particular process. Is that what's happening there? I I wouldn't know. I say I think that's possible. Um, I mean, it's certainly true that when you're in the presence of a painting, um, there's much more to it than comes across in a reproduction. Um, you can see the texture. Uh, the thing is a tactile experience. It changes as you ch change your point of view because of the light and so forth. So, yes, it 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 is more alive, if you like, I guess. People say, um, and this might relate to what you're talking about, that um, they prefer vinyl um, recordings of uh, classical music, say, to CDs. I must say, I don't buy that. I mean, they may be right, but I wonder if they're, I mean, my feeling is they're imagining that because... Uh, I, to me, vinyl is no better than a really good CD. I can still, you know, the, the, the amount, the, the, the gaps between the, um, the moments are so tiny that it's like um, you can't see the individual frames in a cine film. I mean, they're just passing too fast for your brain to be able to see anything other than the illusion of, of motion. Interesting uh, take on it. Uh, you know what's funny about that is there's a whole group of people and that argument has been going on since digital came around. And I tend to agree with you. I always tell people the quality of your speaker is much more important than the source because the speaker has to turn whatever is there to what you're going to be listening to, right? Indeed, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. The, the reason I brought that up for you is because one of the things that I've been noticing is that we've kind of set off a ticker and, and there's a little clock that's been going off with regards to uh, having everybody go in isolation. And usually when somebody has to go to prison and I've spoken to people who've been to prison and they tell me, you know, the day you walk into your cell, you kind of like the whole world kind of snaps into place. You kind of, you know, uh, however much you want to deny the crime you co sort of uh, committed. The fact that they took all your freedoms away, everything sort of snaps into place and you have to learn to accept that as a form of punishment and then hopefully you get better. Even if you're in denial of it, that first night when you're lying yeah. in bed in prison, you get it. But for us, we've all kind of snapped ourselves into a, a semi-prison as well. And there's layers of anxiety that are built around that. And I've been trying to get people, I'm like, you know what, just listen to music. And it seems to help, but not really that much. What is your take and how to help our people, our friends right now who may be experiencing a tremendous amount of anxiety, a tremendous amount of stress, because we went from everybody's cool to like everybody stay home unless you're going to get arrested within a matter of like days. So there's like, it's like we've all become prisoners, but most of us don't even know what the crime we've committed. And so I was just curious as to what your take would be on how to help people uh, cope with some of these uh, rough times that we're in right now. Gosh, well, I think the first thing is probably that it will change its feel. Um, it may initially feel rather panicky that the things you normally do aren't available to you. Um, but there's a certain virtue in letting go of these things and realizing that actually you're still there, you're still okay. So the whole business of slowing down emptying your mind and listening for a change. And now is a very good time to be listening, by the way, um, in a city because you can hear stuff. It's not all drowned out by mechanical din. So learning to be alone and learning to be silent are two of the great things that come out of every wisdom tradition in the history of the world as being part of how one acquires some degree of spiritual nourishment and the idea that you should always be filling it up with something is that you're just driving stuff out you know people have this idea that the more they can cram into their life the richer the life they're leading but it in fact works the other way around so the more you cram stuff into your life the less any of it has any value or meaning which is why of course people who um have enormous wealth are not amongst the happiest people in the world. They tend to be the people who would come knocking at my door <laughs> um, with various kinds of problems, addictions and, and so forth. So actually just learning that simplicity, peace and silence are good is, is one thing. 
and you may only come to that not today but as it were in a couple of days of home with it but you most people nowadays wonderfully do have access to music they have books they have uh, they can go online and read now is a perfect time not just to keep filling the void with complaints about coronavirus but to think let's put coronavirus out of our minds you know uh, I have a, an update on it in the morning and if necessary at night not quite so good that one but anyway um the best thing is during the day to be getting interested in something you've always wanted to know more about learning a skill you know learning a language there are various things you can do and they would help you sort of connect and I think that you know a lot of people um, are also finding that they're rediscovering their family connections. So I think it, it's it's not necessarily like being in prison. Um, all your privileges have not been taken away. Um, but it's easy for me to talk because I I lead a life of a kind of self isolation by choice. I live on a on a remote Scottish island um, in a fairly remote part of it, um, and my favourite times are when there is nothing happening, when there is silence. And people said to me before I came to live here, "Won't you get bored, or, 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 or you know, won't you feel lonely?" Well, actually, I've never been bored, and I've never felt lonely in my life. So uh, I may not be the right person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that reminds me of this old joke. Um, there's a couple of, uh, uh, you know, rich guys. They go on to this um, to this uh, location. They see this guy and, and uh, you know, he's one of the villagers there. And the villager asks him, hey, what, what, are you, what are you doing? He goes, oh, we just, you know, we worked hard all year. We just took some time away to come and, you know, we're just fishing. He goes, oh, okay, cool. Um, I don't have to take any time off. I fish every day. Why don't you just do what I do, right? And the level of disconnect <laughs> between seeing what they have to do to achieve what this gentleman just does all day is sort of like the, the it's, it's kind of like the, the ultimate joke right yeah yeah no it's true the value of money is only to be able to um make possible certain things in your life but for most people it's so hard to let go of the money making process that it drives them you know, a lot of the people who think they're the movers and shakers would be mortified to discover that they're actually puppets. They're being moved and shaken themselves. <laughs> they're not really in control of their life at all. It's 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 funny you mention it that way because uh, one of the things that that kind of I remember the exact location where this happened to me. I was just coming off the highway, and what you when I was uh, listening to the audio book version of your book because what I usually do when I get really uh, fascinating books is I listen to the audio book while I read it and then I read it and then I listen to it it's all back and forth but this one instance caught my attention really really hard which was that your ego so to speak and this is how I interpreted it is your left brain sort of models the world and then starts to tell you a story from within that model and that's how you yeah. think you understood everything in reality you're just a, a, a you're just your own puppet so to speak that's even worse right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, you get to be that if you start seeing yourself as cut off from uh, the rest of humanity and from the world, which is not a matter of physical isolation. Um, you can feel very connected. Um, it's a matter of the way you think. And so, yes, I mean, we are only what we are because of the society that made us what we are, and we're only what we are in what we give back to that society. So... You know, the idea that we are all just put on the planet to sort of go go get is is bizarre in the nth degree. I mean, it, it, it doesn't produce happiness, and it helps to destroy the the planet. So that's a so so. A curious question as a follow up on that is that um, what is your take on what what's the what's going on in the mind of like a sociopath or a psychopath? Is there just a massive disconnect between the master and his emissary, or they're just like, because it seems like they're just basically, uh, they haven't suffered a stroke in the sense that they don't, their right brain is still there. It's just that they've completely muted it. They're just purely left brain approaching the entire problem. And if somebody gets hurt in their process, so be it. Because I was trying to think about what's, what's, what's driving, like, and, and the clear cut example of that is like somebody like Hitler, right? So you look at a person like that, rises to power, 
and then is willing to destroy the world. And if he can't destroy the world, he's willing to destroy his own country just as spite. So I'm just trying to figure out how do how does somebody from your point of view evaluate that kind of mindset? Well, <clears throat> in purely neuropsychological terms, psychopaths do have definite deficits in the right hemisphere, in the master, um, the right ventromedial frontal cortex, which is very important for empathy and for establishing in the infant mother dyad, the it's the right ventromedial frontal cortex of the mother and of the infant, that dialogue. And through that process, the infant realizes that it is with the mother but is not fused with the mother so it can be its own person and yet not abandoned or 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 wholly separate so negotiating which takes a few years negotiating that transition from being a wholly fused part of the mother to being yes independent but not in any sense alien but in fact in some senses more properly connected is all brought about through that part in the brain. Now, we don't know whether it's genetic or environmental, but it's certainly genetic up to quite a large degree, um, that this part of the brain is not functioning in psychopaths. And they therefore don't have empathy. And they also don't feel emotion to the same degree at all so they require more shocking experiences to jolt them into a sense of being alive, really. So they rely on gross stimulation, which often comes from violence or cruelty, to validate their being. Um, but it's very much linked to precisely what you're saying, that the master, the right hemisphere, in particular this part of the frontal cortex, is not working for them. What is scary is, as you know, um, and a whole books have been written about it, that a lot of people who head up institutions, particularly in the commercial world, are on this spectrum. They're, they're, they're somewhere along the psychopathic, narcissistic uh, spectrum. And Hitler was probably more narcissistic than he was psychopathic. Um, he, in fact, was... <clears throat> famously rather averse to cruelty. Um, he was a vegetarian. He was very fond of dogs. <laughs> you know? um, he didn't want to hear any details about what happened in the camps. He just wanted everything to be cleaned up and go away. So he was in major denial and he was, yeah, a narcissist, basically. But I don't think he was a typical example of a psychopath. Interesting. That's uh, So in that regard, I mean, it comes back to the other concept, right? So when I see somebody who's right hemisphere deficit sort of in, in, in your particular frame of reference, what I think about is that their inability to, to process time as a whole, so to speak. They say, a person did something that upset me, they've slighted me, therefore they are now my enemy, I will kill them, etc. As opposed to remembering that that's your friend, they've been with you for a long time, one event does not define your relationship. So they're, they're kind of punctuated reactions to the world around them and the stimulus that they they, they process appears to yes. be demented. I mean, is that is that sort of how, would that be an accurate description of it? Well, not, not the term demented isn't, but, but, but uh, not, not in in psychiatric use of the term but um but i know what you mean and i think what what you're drawing attention to which is absolutely right is that a properly functioning human mind and spirit is the product of a long period of evolution a, a personal evolution i don't mean darwinian evolution i mean that you come to be who you are through the experiences you have so who you are is constantly evolving and growing. And so it's got very deep and rich roots and your experience is um, contextualized. Once again, that important concept that nothing is just taken out of context as a single event. It's seen in the whole context whereby it comes to be seen as something much less threatening or, or, or damaging or violent or whatever it is, then, then it would appear to somebody who 
is operating very superficially. There are, as it were, no depths to the roots. So everything is just uh, a, an immediate reaction to an experience. That That's a deeply dysfunctional way to live. And, you know, it's partly proportionate to intelligence, I'm afraid, that people who are less intelligent are less able to... Um, to, to stand back and see things in in a context, but I'm sure it also has a lot to do with with the personality types that are associated with um, sort of left hemisphere being dominant over the right, and these are people like narcissists and psychopaths and and also borderlines uh, who are very complicated, but but fall into the same um, general uh, area I would say of personality dysfunction. So interesting question as a follow up for you. Um, how come the average person and in the large masses fall for people like this? What is it about our brains that it doesn't give us the ability to detect when we're being lied to? Or is it that we want to believe in the lie so much that we're OK with it? It's like Because the question is, like, how do you let somebody like Hitler come into power? How do you not see through the, the noise that they're generating? How do you not see that they're basically using you? What, what is it in our brains that does that inhibits our ability to see deception right in front of us? Oh, yes. Well, that, that's a big question, and probably there isn't one answer to it. Um, I mean, first of all, on the day-to-day -day rather than the Hitler kind of level, um, we, we are quite good, actually, at detecting when people are lying to us, most people. Um, we can take into account very subtle changes in a facial expression down to only a few hundredths of a second um, and make not infallible but usually quite good deductions from what it is we're seeing. The difficulty with um, psychopaths is not probably so much that they've learned how to disguise their feelings, so certainly they, they do do that, but that because they're actually not feeling the things that an ordinary person would be feeling. They're not giving any of the signs that would alert us to it. Um, and they don't have the feelings of guilt or shame that would be apparent in the facial expressions and the mannerisms of a properly functioning human individual. So there's partly that, that there's a difference between our capacity, which is pretty good for assessing being deceived on a day to day basis, but it's going to let us down in the one to two percent of the population who are seriously psychopathic. And when you come to the Hitler instance, I think we're talking about something else, really, which is, um, well, first of all, very few people would have had any way of being close enough to Hitler to be able to make any assessment of his personality at all. All they would be able to see would be perhaps some photographs and some recordings of his speaking. And I guess that if, as a country, you have experienced um, the ravages of war, um, economic bankruptcy, um, a sudden and colossal loss of prestige as a nation, then somebody who says, I am a strong leader and will help you out of this is not entirely an irrational choice. <laughs> I mean, going on as you are is definitely not what you want to do. So somebody says, I know what to do. On the face of it, it's not entirely irrational, actually, to listen to such a person. What is irrational is that you have more information. If you do have more information about this person, not to take into account what it is that motivates them and whether they've really got the wherewithal to make good decisions. It's, it's a difficult one because sometimes people that we don't like um, can be good at leading. Um, people we wouldn't really want around the dinner table might nonetheless be not such a bad choice um, for doing a certain <laughs> task or role, you know? So... There isn't one answer to all these things, of course, as you would yeah, no, expect. Of course not, of course not. I, and I was just, as you were speaking about that particular issue, I was drawing parallels to the Soviet Union's collapse and their desire to put strongman Putin in charge. And uh, he's yeah, doing yeah. essentially exactly the same sort of uh, playbook, right? Um, yeah, but yeah. What, 
what I wanted to, to bring to your attention and, and get your take on is this whole process of what is it about, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of like, I when I open old books, like, the first thing I look for is the opening sentence, right? When I read the opening sentence of 1984, I just pause and I yeah. just sit there and I just chills up my spine. So when I think about that aspect of it, and then I think of Twitter and how it says, hey, we're not going to let you ramble on for 50 paragraphs. We're just going to force you to a specific character set. And then the wittier or the funnier your take is, the more, quote unquote, viral it goes. What is it about yeah. that process? How come certain words are able to do that? And I, you know, I'm trying to recall the the particular instances. That I mean, uh, Oscar Wilde would be amazing on Twitter. So would Mark Twain if they were still around. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so what exactly is it is uh, about that process? What is it that you know when you see a Yogi Bearism? I remember at near the end of your book, you were talking about how, you know, uh, the the uh, Asian. Uh, I think it was a Chinese way of saying that a man too humble is uh, half too prideful, right? So there's this whole idea of the sentence in itself is structured in such a way that it contradicts itself, but we find that so fascinating. I'm trying to find out what exactly is it that makes it so fascinating. I still haven't been able to find a satisfactory answer to that, and I apologize if that sounds like my left brain trying to model your idea so that I can use it for my own benefit. Well, a lot of things, really. I, I think, you know, humor is rather like poetry in that it's mainly implicit and it's what is not said that is uh, really powerful. So, um, and and interestingly, the interpretation of poetry, of metaphor, uh, particularly original metaphor, and of jokes and humor is very dependent on the right frontal cortex. And people who have damage in that area can't find things funny anymore and take poems literally. So they have a lot in common. Um, I think the ability to do that in an encapsulated way uh, so that it's memorable is is a real gift. Um, Not only it's a gift to the person that has the talent, but it's a gift that they pass on every time they make people laugh. So I I, I see comedians, really great comedians, um, as people who um, who have something deeply important to to tell us and do for us. Um, uh, the, the very short, pithy sort of remark is is beautiful because of its economy. Um, like a very short poem that's perhaps only four lines long, but manages to pack a lot in. Um, it's rather like a game of squash. It sort of lasts a short while, but does you a power of good if it doesn't kill you. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> these very, they're very economically compressed um, experiences uh, are something that we gravitate towards and, and find exciting. Um, quite rightly. But what was going on in my mind when you were mentioning Oscar Wilde was that, frankly, an awful lot of Oscar Wilde's witticisms in the end are not really that deep. But, I mean, some of them are very funny uh, and some of them are very cruel, um, which can make you laugh. Right. Um, but, but what made him great was going to prison going back to our earlier conversation, and De Profundis, which he wrote from prison, I mean, it's the Latin for out of the depths, um, you suddenly realise what a profound and deep person this was. And actually, without that formative experience, he would never have brought that to fruition in his life. He would never have been able to communicate that um, to to his uh, to his audience so sometimes actually being able to say a little bit longer is more valuable well usually it is unfortunately because most things can't just be summed up in that way but it's very nice it's like kind of um scoring a bullseye you know it's just beautiful there it goes bing, and you know a ripple of laughter and and there you are yeah you know as, as you were talking you. about that go ahead sorry no, I was, I was just going to say, I must tell you my favourite Oscar Wilde witticism. He was approached by the club bore, uh, who came up to him and said, Oh, Mr. Wilde, I passed your house this morning. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> it's so economic. It's so cruel and it's so beautiful that probably the person who received the response didn't realize what had been said. Anyway, yes. 
Well, you know, as you were mentioning that, I I, I started to notice it in, in a following way, just sort of like how I was describing your book, is that when you mm. when some people speak, it's like they're dropping pennies and you're waiting to collect enough for a dollar so it's worth your response, while other people just drop yeah. hundred dollar bills and it's like, hey, there there's 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 a beautiful little um phrase I can work with, and and one of the interesting people is Robert Mugabe. I mean, terrible human being, but he was actually very sharp and very witty. And I'll give you an example of one of the things he said was that when once goat goes missing, the aroma of a neighbor's soup gets suspicious, right? So when you hear <laughs> you hear things of that sort and you go, you know what? Sometimes, because I've been always trying to figure it out, how come a terrible person can become so popular? And then I realized that there's something there that we're not fully able to appreciate because we characterize. We caricatured their personality from multiple dimensions into the one dimension that we either like or we dislike. And as a consequence, we, again, deceive ourselves from the full potential of what that person has to offer. It's just that when they start to believe their own um, ideas too quickly and too far, that's when they start to, you know, uh, put the master in a locked bedroom and the emissary goes run, running wild, right? Yes, indeed. And, of course, we shouldn't forget the obvious that if you're Mugabe or Putin, um it's very easy to get your own way because you terrify people and you've got an army on your side. So, you know, yeah, just good old fashioned feel, do an awful lot. Yeah. We have a question from our mutual friend, Mike Driver. He wanted to know, does the right hemisphere reside outside of time? If the answer is yes, then what is time? Is there only one time and it is now? <laughs> well, thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for holding a googly. That's a really... <laughs> difficult um, question to answer. Um, I don't know if we have time, but I think what I would distinguish is, I think it's quite wrong to say, I thought about this a great deal, and actually what physicists say, uh, they, they often contradict one another, but I think there's a consensus that time is actually not an illusion. It's the one thing that is not an illusion. And I, I, I've come to the conclusion that that is probably right. And it's also true in all the wisdom literature, uh, including Oriental um, Buddhist Taoist literature, is that the flow of time is real. It's the one thing that is real. However, if you are in tune with the flow of time, in a sense, it ceases to exist. In, I mean, it's still there. But the thing is that you are not somehow being passed by it or passing it by. It's a bit like if you stand on the bank of a stream and watch the river going by, then you can see certainly the flowing of time. But if you were so perfectly in the water and floating with it and not striving at all, you would be buoyed along by the water in the sense that Relative to the water, you really weren't moving. So for you, the, the thing was present all the time. You were in the present all the time. So I think it's possible to be in the present, as many mystical traditions enjoin on us, without abolishing time. I hope that makes some sense, but it's the best I can do. At the <laughs> it certainly does. I just had a question for you on, um, I was reading Dr. David R. Hawkins. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but no. I... I Personally, I, when I read your work and I read his work and I'm like, wow, these are peop two people talking about the same thing from different points of view. And, and in uh -huh. essence, what, what, what he always uh, – the lesson that I le learned from him that's more applicable with, with regards to what you're saying here is that um, context defines content. And in this case, the idea of standing in the river and recognizing you as a, uh, a divine being who has been blessed to, to, to inhabit such a beautiful planet – and the cost of your life is actually the cost of the solar system and how expensive the sun is to build and the planet and all the things that make it possible for you to be alive. When you contextualize it yeah. that way, no matter how miserable you're feeling that minute, you can actually just snap out of it. So my question to you, which might be helpful for our listeners, is how do people escape a negative train of thought? What is your best recommendation to help people when they're feeling really down or when they're feeling really anxious to be able to quickly shift perspective in a way that's replicable and it's uh, effective and it's you know obviously it's not going to cover everybody but uh, but you know we want to try to kind of leave our listeners with a, a practical application of your work 
and I highly recommend the book. And, I, and I'm also know I know you're working on another book because I know that's what you're doing with your time yeah. that that's that's down here. So please elaborate on on your your next book and 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 if you can give us a little gem of how to handle anxiety and and stress and depression and to contextually shift well, perspective, that would be great. Well, sure. I mean, uh, of course, if I could really answer that question, um, uh, I'd have done my whole profession out of out of a job. But um, there, <laughs> there isn't any one easy way that works for everybody. But I do think there are habits of mind um, that help. Um, and one is to become very focused and centered in the moment that you're in, in, in quite a concrete way, so that you, you, you think, OK, what can I do? I can, I can make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. And you make it. And you, you're aware of what you're doing in the making of it. And you're aware of the smell of the coffee, as it were, and you can feel the warmth of the mug as you put your hands around it, and you sit and be present for these things and allow them to be present to you. And in doing that, you're already distancing yourself from the monkey mind that's chattering away about whatever it's concerned about, and you're more centered in where you are now. It encourages you to stop taking um, catastrophic remote views of all the things that could happen and focus on what actually is happening at the moment and try and leave the things that might happen out for the time that you're um, doing this sort of an exercise. And I think also focusing on two things we are not so good at really these days. One is on being grateful, on being thankful on gratitude for what we have. And if you think you've got nothing to be thankful for, think again. There are very few situations in life in which one cannot adopt an attitude of thankfulness. And there's a Chinese story of um, a monk who is a novice who's being trained. And he says, well, what, what, do, what do I say to people who are suffering and are... Um, in, in grave difficulties, and how, how do I how do I deal with that? And so his Zen master said, "Go and ask Monk X, who was living in a cave up a mountainside." So, <laughs> so he goes to Monk X and says, "But perhaps you can tell me um, about this." And he says, "Oh, you've come to the wrong person because I have had nothing in my life for which I cannot be thankful." And he smiles, and the monk, the young monk, the novice monk, realized in that moment what he was being told because he knew that this man's life had been fraught by all kinds of difficulties and problems. So the practice of gratitude, the practice of being present, these are two very good things, counting one's blessings. Um, an awful lot of things that I was taught as a child, actually, and thought at the time, <laughs> why should I do that? And why should I forgive people? I don't feel like it. But of course, what you don't realize, it, realize is that by not forgiving somebody, the only person you're hurting is yourself. So all these things are very wise. <laughs> um, let me tell you a little bit about my, my, my new book, uh, if I can, very briefly. Um, Yes, please. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm calling it The Matter With Things, which is a sort of pun on several levels. Um, and it's really trying to break away from the, in my view, entirely impoverished and indeed feeble-minded um, view of materialist reductionism that we're constantly peddled uh, by pop science. Um, and I want to offer a serious critique of it and to ask the question, actually, what do we know? How can we know it? And what can we trust? And at the first part of the book, I look at the sort of ways in which we get a handle on reality. First of all, and primarily through our attention and the kind of attention we pay, which alters what it is that we find. Um, perception, the judgments we form on our perceptions, which often happen immediately, because we never perceive just meaningless colors or sounds. We already perceive them as something familiar to us. Um, emotional and social intelligence, cognitive intelligence, good old fashioned IQ, um, and creativity. And I look at all those and 
what the right hemisphere offers and what the left hemisphere offers. And what, to cut a very long story short, what I demonstrate is that actually when we're attending to what the left hemisphere is showing us, we're getting something that is substandard compared with what the right hemisphere is able to show us. So that's the first part of the book. The second part of the book, I'm looking at the sort of paths that any human being might take towards uncovering the truth or the relative truth, because there is no absolute truth, but the things that we can more rely on. Um, than anything else in our lives. And I would say there are broadly three or four of these. There's science, there's reason, there's intuition and imagination. And in each of these, I show that they have strengths, but they also have weaknesses. And that if we're to approach the world properly, we need to bring to bear as many of these as possible together, or not necessarily at the same time. But at least in our assessment, we need to be able to satisfy ourselves that we've not completely denied one or two of these. Um, and I think in general, at the moment, we use at maximum two, usually only one of these to answer a question. So that's the first part of that. And the other part is that in every case, including science and reason, what I can demonstrate is that the most important element that is contributed comes actually from the right hemisphere. I mean, I, I can show you that scientific discoveries, mathematical discoveries, practically all their um, ontology, their phenomenology is due to the workings more of the right hemisphere than of the serial procedural mode of the left hemisphere. And then in the final part of the book, I look at the sort of building blocks, if you like, of the cosmos that are paradoxical. Things like time, space, matter, consciousness, value and the sacred um, and I suggest various things that with armed with what we've learned we can see why it is that we often have two different ways of looking at the world that are paradoxically opposed one perhaps being more what the left hemisphere says and one being more perhaps what the right hemisphere says and my suggestion is that we need to listen to both but as you'll have discovered from reading the book up to this point we ought to be giving precedence, the mastery, to the version of the right hemisphere, not the other way around, which is what we tend to do now. Um, and the other thing is that I do think that at the end, I have a chapter on the coincidence of opposites, that a thing and its opposite need to be taken into account together. Now, in the world that we live nowadays, so much of our thinking is black and white. We see something as good, we see its opposite, and we see them at either ends of a yardstick and we think the further we go towards this thing that we've decided in the abstract is good and the further we go away from that thing that is utterly remote from it that we think is bad the better we will do but actually what happens is we begin to approach the very thing we dreaded because in fact the world is not built on these um, straight lines in which opposites are separate but in circles and spirals whereby they come back to haunt you so in denying things that you think are bad, in cutting out what Jung called the dark side, in denying things that you at this moment in time, with your limited intelligence and assessment, think are bad, you're actually inviting something bad to happen. You need actually to embrace the thing and its opposite. And to give you just a little final image to take on that, it comes from Heraclitus, a pre-Socratic philosopher, so 6th century BC, and who I still think is probably the most profound philosopher who ever lived. And he has this wonderful image. He says, people do not understand that it is a harmony, opposites together. So that he, he sees it as like a string that is taut on a bow, and it's through the tautness of the bow being pulled equally in two directions that there is the life in the bow that lets fly the arrow, or the string on a lute, that just through the tension in the string being pulled maximally in both directions that gives the strength in the string that allows the note to come forth. And it wouldn't be better if you just compromised and said, well, what's the point in pulling in two opposite directions? Let's just stop pulling and let it go flabby. Then nothing happens at all. That is the basis on which everything exists. So that is a very quick rundown on my on my new book. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as you as you were mentioning that, I just remembered a T.S. Eliot quote, which is that you know we go in circles and then we get to see things for the first time again. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm reading what you're I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what you have to say, and uh, I'm utterly fascinated. I can't wait for your uh, next book to come out. I'll be happy to to grab a copy as soon as it does. Um, so what I wanted to do, and I want to respect your time, um, is, is there any other areas that we didn't cover for you that you feel like you still want to expand on? Well, there's an infinite number of areas we could cover, but I, I feel very <laughs> satisfied with, with, with what we've managed to do. I feel we've covered quite a lot. I hope some of it made sense. I'm very grateful to you for being such a very kind interlocutor. And, and so, yes, good. Thank you so much. We will have the uh, re- list of recommended books that you uh, want our readers to read. Obviously, your book being there, uh, number one. Uh, so I would appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you so much, Ian. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we have. The truth is, any conversation worthy of having will inherently be a risky one. Thank you for listening. Stay anti-fragile and carry on the ancient tradition and your own unique way of saying what only you can say and doing what only you can do. Abiding by Milton's words, this is Ember Sadat and Ace Deliri signing off, wishing you the very best of worthy and risky conversations.